It's 30 seconds to go. We. Oui. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be first. And then I'm going to be Yeah, you hand over Stephanie. Stephanie. Stephanie's going, I'm going to announce the right in the We can, uh, Pascal, even if we have, not everybody's here, we'll start on time because we have people waiting online, okay? So colleagues, go. Colleagues, it's already two past two. We have uh, attendees joining us online. So this is why we will start um, this session. We are now launching the session. Also, here in Geneva, we ended the sessions late for the audience online, and people are finishing eating and joining the room. But uh, I'm looking at the panel and announcing that we are now officially launching this event. This event. Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon uh, to who is with us at the International Conference Center in Geneva. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is, uh, has joined us on WebEx or is now watching the recording of this event. We have the pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon um, to the 2023 uh, World Resources Forum Lab, co-organized uh, uh, with GRID uh, Geneva. Um, that is launching uh, the Marine Sandwatch, a new global data platform created by Grid Geneva that tracks and monitors sand extraction in the marine environment. Our event today will be moderated by Stephanie Schwa, who is a program officer at the UNEP Grid Geneva office, and she will take over the moderation after you are formally welcomed um, to this event by Elisa Tonda, uh, who is the chief of the Resource and Markets Branch of the United Nations Environment Programme, and Elisa is based here in Geneva. Before I hand over to Ms. Tonda, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary, as well as the video of the event will be made available on the web page of this event. I keep repeating this at all events because we keep receiving questions uh, uh, um, on the access to, to all these links. And the link is being shared uh, on the slide. Throughout the event, uh, for those who are online, you can raise your questions uh, by using the Q&A box. We have a dedicated session uh, to answer these after the presentations, and of course, we will, the moderator will also interact uh, with uh, the attendees who are here in the room. Finally, let me also add for who is online that the transcription is available at the bottom left of your screen. Have a look at the current slide, which shows where to access automated transcript in over 100 languages. With that, Ms. Tonda, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and, and good day to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you and just share some thoughts of where what is happening today is fitting within the work of the um, uh, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. 
So as you probably have heard in a number of sessions that you might have been following during these days, minerals play a very central role in enabling the transition to green economies, to low carbon economies, to the achievement of the SDGs. And as countries are accelerating their efforts into that transition, into that shift, we also need to make sure that the extraction of natural resources is not augmenting the stress on people and on the environment. And research is reminding us that a lot of the resources that might be needed for accelerating these transitions are actually located in context with a high environmental, social, and governance complexities. And this is precisely why uh, the United Nations Environment Program in its medium-term strategy has concentrated its attention on the mining sector as one of those sectors that we call high impact sector, a sector where the improvement in practices and policies can yield significant benefits in addressing the triple planetary crisis of climate biodiversity and pollution. We are frequently hearing the role that minerals and metals play in the transition, in the energy transition. And again, for those who have been in a number of sessions uh, during the World Resources Forum, you have heard reference being made to the role of lithium, cobalt, nickel. Though it's fair to say that conversations around sands and gravels, which are the largest volume material extracted by humans, are not capturing as much attention as the other resources I was referring to. On the other hand, there are multifaceted interactions with the addressing of the triple planetary crisis are very clear and very evident. They, the dredging of sand can have an important impact on biodiversity, for example. But at the same time, sand is a very important resource for coastal protection and an important asset in climate adaptation. As said, the attention to the issue of sand is not as strong as to other minerals and metals that are uh, strategic for the energy transition, though it has been growing over time. And you surely recall that in uh, 2020, the countries at the IUCN Pro Pro Congress called for urgent action for the management of marine and coastal sand including the stop of all illegal sand mining activities. And in two following United Nations Environment Assembly, resolutions were put forward and approved by member states that actually had the atten uh, specific attention to the issue of sand in the context of sustainability. The most recent one being a resolution approved at the fifth session of the UN Environment Assembly, Resolution 12, that among others requested to strengthen the science, technically, technical and policy knowledge with regard to sand extraction and use. Not only that same resolution has asked to convene an uh, intergovernmental consultation to identify at a regional scale and at an international scale which issues were relevant for countries globally. And in several conversations, in several consultations, the subject of sand and sustainability has been put forward in what this process, this resolution refers to as non-prescriptive proposal. And later this week, uh, Thursday and Friday, that group, that consultation will convene globally to further discuss and to further de deepen the conversation around issues that have been raised at the regional level and therefore very likely deepen the conversation around sand. So here we are today with uh, the, the purpose of addressing one of the call that this resolution was actually putting forward and the Marine Sand Watch is very critically a response to the call to strengthening the science, technical and policy knowledge, starting from science and therefore influencing um, policy decision. And you will hear a lot more from my colleague Pascal Peduzzi, who has been in the lead of taking that work stream forward. But let me conclude 
by highlighting that ourselves as an organization and the team that have been leading this work stream is really very much looking forward to continuing the work with all the stakeholders around along the sand supply chain, including member states, including industries that are involved in different ways in this value chain, including the research community, to continue raising the attention to sand and gravel as a very strategic uh, resource in the context of the uh, green and low carbon uh, transition, and also to engage in discussion on how we can improve the performance along this value chain going forward. Let me conclude by thanking the government of Switzerland, thanks to whom all of this has been materialized, not only the activities around sand, but also the consultation process that has uh, been coming to the maturity that will bring us tomorrow and Friday in the global consultation, in the global meeting. And I wish you all a very fruitful discussion during this event. Stephanie, I'm going to hand the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> Thank you once again, Alyssa, for helping set the stage for today's discussion. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank um, our partner in this event, the Geneva Environment Network and the team for making the event today possible. A warm welcome to our audience here in the room and also online um, to the launch of the Marine Sand Watch, the world's first data platform designed to monitor large dressing vessels engaged in dredging activities in the marine environment around the globe. As we've just heard, sand is becoming a very strategic material um, and that we know sand extraction as a whole causes a variety, a multitude of environmental impacts and it's becoming one of the more urgent issues, um, socio-economic issues of the 21st century. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Pascal Petuzzi, the Director of Great Geneva, United Nations Environment Programs Center for Analytics, um, who will be sharing with us his thoughts on this issue and also showcasing the platform for the very first time. Thank you, Pascal. Many thanks, uh, Stephanie. Yes, I'm very happy because today is the launch of this idea that was initiated in uh, in 2019 uh, of doing something for monitoring the sand in the marine environment. And it's about making the invisible visible. And uh, we are not uh, really aware of how much sand we are using. Um, if I ask you how much sand you've been using today, probably you say nothing. But if you look around you, it's all made of concrete. We have windows, you walk on the streets. Everything is made of sand and gravels. And we don't realize it's the invisible hero of uh, our development. It's really everywhere. And we tend not to recognize it. Uh, in 2020, there was uh, um, pub uh, published rep um, articles in Nature saying that the dry biomass of the entire vegetation, if you take its weight, <laughs> has been exceeded by the weight of the human um, <clears throat> built uh, material. So all the aggregates, concrete, the roads, the bricks, the wall, everything is now weighting more than the dry biomass of the entire vegetation of planet Earth. And most of that, the vast majority, is sand. And that how come it is the elephant in the room? But we use it for roads. We use it for all kinds of buildings, houses, offices, schools, hospitals, all kinds of um, infrastructures like dams, bridges, uh, tunnels, dikes, airports, harbors, and also the solar panels uh, that we use for energy transition is made of silica sand. Glass for windows and bottles, all of that is made of, of sand. Even the memory chips of our computers are made of silica sand. And we also do land reclamation. So all this amount of sand is giant, but it's not only for the building, we also use it for the nature. Well, we don't use it. Turtles use it for nesting, um, fishes, crabs. Uh, look, this is me in Tunisia where people have extracted sand that, that uh, is making people more vulnerable to climate change. And of course, we want beaches for tourism industry. So we have this tension between the use of sand as a building material for infrastructures and also the use and the services that we need sand in the natural environment, because sand is also a necessary support for our fishes in the bottom of the ocean, in the benthic area. Uh, we are using sand uh, for the protection of our shoreline, the, the beaches are protecting us from storm surge, from sea, uh, salty infiltration of waters in our coastal aquifers. The, the, um, but we are extracting 50 billions of sand per year globally. And part of that 
um, so it's sand and gravel. But part of that is now we know four to eight billion tons of sediments are extracted the moon from the marine environment, and that's what we didn't know about it. And that's what we are launching this platform today to know what amount is taken from the sediment. So that's slowly getting attention. In 2019, we had the mineral resource governance at UNEA4. Then, as Elisa was mentioning, the IUCN uh, call for the urgent global management of marine and coastal sand resources. And now, since 2022, this mandate given to Grid Geneva to strengthen scientific, technical, and policy knowledge with regard to sand use and sand extraction. So, bringing more science into that and in, in policy is what we're trying to do. Sand can be extracted from quarries in static environment. In those locations, it doesn't interact, like crunching rocks as well. But it can also be extracted from the beaches. And that's where it interacts with the environment. So this is dynamic area or from rivers where it's changed the, the river flows and increasingly from the marine environment. That's what we're going to look at. Because in the marine environment, look at this boat. It looks like a giant vacuum cleaner and sterilizing the bottom of the ocean. And that's what they do. Uh, look at the impact. Uh, in number seven, you see the track where the sand is being extracted. It's crunching all the microorganisms that are killed. Then the small particles in three are um, uh, changing the turbidity of the waters, creating what we call a plume. And then the coarse material, that's too coarse for them, 11, get dumped on the other organisms. Then you have the noise by the boats. And other impacts is if you go too close from the shore, you might induce a coastal erosion. So there's a lot of different impacts. So how do we monitor that? Well, each large vessels are emitting radio signals we call automated identification system, AIS, which allows us to spot the way they move. And the boats that are moving uh, for fishing or as a cargo, they don't move the same way that boats that are dredging. And if they go back and forth, like we see on this picture, we, the, we can identify they are dredging. And then we know from the signal who they are, what's the tonnage, uh, how long they've been doing it, where they go, and so on and so forth. So this is what we've been doing. And we have uh, been training an artificial intelligence to detect those movements automatically, because imagine all those vessels are emitting signals every minute and they're all around the world, and we do that from 2012 to now. So it's a huge amount of data that we need to, to crunch. So after having crunched this data, we know where the sand has been taken. We put that in this platform. We can uh, also make the total amount by location, but we aggregate, aggregate that um, by country and to know where in the economic exclusive zone, how much uh, volume of sand, how many operators, how many um, uh, companies and, and vessels are being up, uh, operating this region. And we know what are the um, roughly a good estimation on what is the amount of sediment that is shifted. So each year, the rivers bring 10 to 16 billion tons of sediment to the oceans, but we humans are already moving or extracting about half of it, 6 billion tons, four to eight. Huh? So already half of that, so it means we have a tremendous impact because these sediments are very much needed. 6 billion tons is so big. Uh, let me give you an idea. It's like building a wall of 10 meter by 10 meter all around planet Earth every year, or two kilograms per day per person uh, for all the 8 billion people, or more than 1 million trucks per day. You choose your figure. All of them just are mind boggling on how much we're taking. And we don't know everything. There are still some activities that we don't know about. Some, some boats, small boats like those one, are not equipped with AIS uh, signals, so we cannot track them. So we still need to find more invisible stuff and make it, it um, visible. That's what we will try to do um, on the Global Sand Observatory, also looking at terrestrial sand. But for the time being, we've been looking at uh, what's happening in the marine environment. And in West Africa, they were saying that 3.8 billions of dollars in 2017 was the impact from coastal degradation and mostly uh, linked with sand extractions. Mekong River also over extracted and is leading to land erosion. So we need to figure out. So let's have a look at this platform. There's a story map that is to, to, to go through that uh, platform in a more easiest way, but there are all kinds of lay layers. It's an interactive mapping platform where we can zoom at different locations. We will zoom uh, over North Sea, and you start to see what are the activities over there. We can zoom further. Uh, we see where in orange shade what where people are extracting sand, and those pink dots is where the boats are offloading the, the sand. We see the piles of sand and the trucks, so we can really see that uh, we, we spot the right locations. 
Um, then we have this exclusive economic zone or 200 nautic miles where we can click. Uh, this is the Netherlands. We have number of operators. We have the lower and upper estimates with our margin of error. Uh, go to France and it's all the countries. So you can really see if we go to uh, India, you can see that it was zero in 2012 and it's sharply uh, increasing. So well, then we can zoom on what they're doing with it. We see now we have new harbors infrastructures in Bahrain. Um, in uh, Maldives, we see that they are crea creation of artificial islands. And if we go now to Sri Lanka, we see a new harbors in Colombo and it's live. It's not PowerPoint. You can always uh, zoom and pan. Uh, in Shanghai, there are maintenance of the river dredging. Um, so you can see that it's in purple. Um, lots of material are being used in Singapore that expanded its territory using sand. Uh, in Western Africa, the creation of a new beach and harbor infrastructure or the cleaning of X channel. We can watch all kinds of activities in terms of dredging, maintenance, extractions, and so on. North Sea is, is quite amazing in terms of um, the, the footprint of these processes for getting sand. Uh, for building and, and uh, postal infrastructures. Refurbishing the beaches in Florida, big business. Cleaning the uh, Panama Channel, of course, that is needed for the vessels to continue uh, going through. So we've been monitoring worldwide. We know what amount is being extracted in the marine environment per country, which you can see on this map. And uh, we will further continue this data processing to continue making the invisible visible. And uh, with this, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Um, so I think I would like to invite um, our, a few experts that we have here to start a discussion around this. But um, just a quick note to our audience online, um, feel free to key in your questions um, and we will get to that later um, after hearing from our experts. And so first uh, we have here Laura, Laura Flachkov, um, and um, she is the senior policy advisor at the Federal Office for the Environment of Switzerland. Um, so, Laura, Switzerland has been quite engaged uh, on the multilateral level, especially on um, mineral management as a whole, but sand management in particular. Um, so, Switzerland is co-chairing the intergovernmental consultations for the UNEA resolutions um, on the environmental aspects of minerals and metals and hosting the global consultation happening um, starting tomorrow here in Geneva. And you are the national focal point for this process. So, could you share with us um, what, um, how do you envision that the role of the Marine Sand Watch um, fitting within the framework of uh, Switzerland's um, engagement framework, sorry, and what specific developments do you would you like to see um, at the international level? Well, thank you uh, very much, Stephanie, for uh, the introduction and giving me the floor. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Unibrid Geneva for this uh, big achievement. I think there is a lot of hard work behind that. It looks very easy and very simple to understand or to see the interface, but it's uh, a lot of work behind and uh, it's quite an achievement. I think it's a very innovative tool which uh, can be very useful for countries across the globe and it will also bring uh, a lot of transparency on this uh, topic. So you may think uh, why is Switzerland engaged on this topic of minerals and sand in particular. Actually there are quite a number of reasons um, with respect to sand. Uh, first, as any country, um, Switzerland, in Switzerland, we consume a lot of, uh, of sand, actually. Um, they contribute to about 40% of uh, Switzerland material footprint, uh, all the construction materials, so sand, uh, gravel and other non-metallic minerals. They are uh, largely mined in Switzerland, but we also face these challenges with respect to that. Also, a uh, uh, growing demand, an exploitation that creates pressure on the environment. Uh, on the climate, on the landscape, and there are also conflicts of interest with other uses of the landscape, with uh, tourism, for instance. And there is a lot of potential, I think, for better managing this uh, resource uh, through more circularity um, in buildings, for instance. So we use sand in Switzerland for infrastructure, for construction, but also uh, in many other sectors uh, for glass, for um, our computers, our cars, and many of the uh, goods that we import in Switzerland um, have an environmental impact abroad. So that's also to be taken into account. So that's why we are committed internationally 
um, on the um, on the topic of um, uh, sustainable management of uh, minerals that's actually uh, coherent with our constitutional mandate as well to uh, protect uh, natural resources and commit internationally for that and sand is also has also a key role with respect to um, climate change and biodiversity and that's something maybe we don't uh, think about um, at the beginning um, when we think about sand but sand serves as pascal you said uh, as habitat for various species uh, especially in coastal environments it's also key for climate uh, mitigation and adaptation so uh, if you extract sand in some um, areas it can also disturb uh, the climate regulatory function of the ocean so that's also um, important uh, with our engagement in other areas such as the climate and biodiversity so sand it's linked with all sdgs either because we need sand to achieve the sdg or because um, its extraction creates um, can affect sustainability efforts. Uh, that's why um, it's so important to look at this uh, issue. And um, as was uh, mentioned by Pascal um, and uh, Elisa at, at the start, it's very striking that sand is such an important material, but it doesn't have so much attention uh, at the international level uh, until recently. And um, we still uh, don't have a global overview of uh, the level of extraction. Uh, we are not really in a position to anticipate uh, the needs. So from a policy making perspective, I think this is uh, a problematic. Um, and that's maybe there are maybe a, a number of reasons for that, because it's considered rather as a low value minerals and it's not necessarily a priority compared to other metals that, which are very visible in um, international discussion. Um, so, but things are changing, I think, at the international level. Uh, so we see that uh, it's increasingly making it on the uh, global policy agenda. Uh, we have um, we had uh, several reference already uh, to the Uni United Nations Environmental Assembly resolutions. Uh, so the United Nations Environmental Assembly, that's the world's highest decision making uh, body on the environment where all countries uh, meet to set the global environmental agenda and there um, in recent years so um, member states adopted uh, in total four resolutions actually which relate to sand there were two resolutions relating to minerals but also two other resolutions relating to uh, sustainable infrastructure and um, for all these resolutions, Switzerland was very active. We also initiated uh, the, um, with other countries the, uh, the last uh, resolution on environmental um, aspects of minerals and metals. And this resolution has a strong component uh, with respect to sand. And as part of this, the implementation of this resolution, um, member states uh, started to gather uh, in the different regions of the world over the last month to discuss ways to better manage minerals in general, but sand was really an important topic in the discussions. I don't want to anticipate too much because there will be a session dedicated uh, to that process at 4.30, just after this one. Uh, but um, I, maybe I want to highlight the fact that uh, member states in the discussions really um, um, expressed a lot of needs with respect to sand in terms of the need for more awareness about the impacts of sand, the need for more data collection and analysis, for more technical expertise, better monitoring and um, better assessment of an environmental impacts. So I think that this um, launch of the Marine Sand Watch is very timely. It really uh, can really contribute to uh, respond to, uh, to uh, many needs that were uh, expressed. And because the tool is um, publicly available, I think it's uh, not only useful for governments, but also for the industry, uh, um, for the financial sector as well, maybe, uh, because it's they are also part of this um, uh, value chain of sound uh, value chain. So I think it's, um, it's a very useful tool. And this tool um, uh, could also be uh, one part of a, a bigger initiative, maybe uh, the Global Sand Observatory, which is an idea that has been also discussed as part of the 
uh, UNIA uh, process um, uh, related to this uh, resolution 12. And this idea of an observatory would be really to connect stakeholders that are um, working a lot in, in silos at the moment um, and that could really help to uh, gather uh, data even beyond the marine environment and look uh, uh, beyond in other areas and have a better, much better uh, view of what's happening and how we can better manage, how we can uh, have a, a better framework and better policies. So um, that's uh, a little bit, um, I think, my point for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and you brought up quite a few interesting points, but I think that that allows us to segue um, to to Vera, our uh, next uh, expert here. We have Dr. Vera van Langer, who is a marine geologist uh, at the Royal Belgium Institute of Natural Sciences and a professor at Ghent University. Vera, thank you for joining us today. Um, we have heard just now from Elisa, Pascal, and especially Laura, who talks about the lack of uh, a global overview, um, the lack of visibility on this issue, and also the need um, for data, um, especially requested from countries itself, um, themselves. And you are an author of the 2022 Sand and Sustainability Report, and you advocated um, in your report, in the report, sorry, you advocated not only for the improved resource mapping at local levels, but also uh, on a regional um, level and on a broader scale. So your emphasis has always been on the significance on, of investing in strategic resource mapping, comprehensive accounting and reporting, as well as an in, uh, integrative and predictive science. So all of this underscore the essential steps needed to ensure a sustainable long-term sand supply, as, as you've mentioned in the report, um, and to mitigate environmental aspects. So. Uh, Vera, so drawing from your work, since you are a marine geologist and your work day in and out is about sand, um, how do you see Marine Sand Watch supporting the data and science needed for better mapping and monitoring, especially by countries? Okay, uh, so first of all, also thank you uh, for being here and, uh, and also congratulations with the tool. So, um, so indeed, I think that um, the tool will be really very valuable and bringing data and information together. Uh, because on the one hand, like first of all, it will show, I think, especially on a global level, that we know so little about the seafloor. Eh? So the majority will be just blank. Uh, so at best, and, and we are all working on that, uh, we are trying to, to map the seabed progressively. So there are initiatives like Seabed 2030 that want to map at a sufficient detail the entire ocean by 2030, but by now we are only very marginally building up the, the knowledge. Uh, in the north, we, we do have uh, the EMONTNET program, uh, the uh, European Marine Data Observation Network, which is really investing already for since 2009, I guess. Um, that's, we are mapping progressively the, the geology, the habitats, the biology, human activities. And this is really progressing very well, but still, if you map that on a global level, it's still marginal and we have to progress and, and stimulate uh, each other. And this is uh, the, the very good thing about UNEP that you are boosting us to do better and to, 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 to make significant steps uh, forward. But still, we also need to recognize that there are areas with no maps at all. And so there is also a very big need for, for training and capacity building on how we can scale up the whole mapping process. Still, if we think about long-term planning and um, the many challenges we face with respect to the sand need, it's really becoming more and more a transboundary challenge. Uh, so it's not only about our in situ little mapping programs, but we really need to, to scale up uh, because we will need increasing we will face increasing demands and in many areas the member state will not have it and will, will have to, to get it from, from somewhere else. So, um, so in Belgium, for instance, um, we have, uh, well, we were successful in, uh, in mapping on a more regional scale, so for Belgium and also part of the Netherlands. And there it was quite unique. We, we got to map the quality and the quantity of our sand reserves. Um, so um, 
it's still a rough estimate with, with uh, lots of data uncertainties, but still we have a basis uh, to, to work further, a basis that, that needs to be more detailed in some areas, because you really need to know how much sand you have of a certain quality. Uh, people will say, especially in the North Sea, it's a sandy shelf environment, and that's the case. But still, if you take away that sand top, and in many cases only a very sand veneer of centimeters thick, you get into clay. And so in many areas or parts of, of, our, uh, of our shelf, um, we are lacking even uh, sand uh, locally. So uh, there is really a need to, to get to the volumes and to, to progress on, uh, on that. Um, but okay, there are case studies like in Belgium that's showing, okay, it is possible. And there are also frameworks, and especially uh, related to the geological surveys, that are really paving the way of more structurally mapping the seabed in all its uh, dimensions. So the, the work is ongoing, but still we need to go faster and, and much more structurally than we do um, today. Um, so by bringing these data together in such a platform, this will directly be evidenced where are we? Huh? Where, where are the true data gaps? Where are the needs? So coupling data and information will, will really uh, boost uh, us all, and that, that's quite needed. So then we come to the, to the monitoring part, because on the one hand, the, the plea is we need to extract less and better, um, but we need so much more. Huh? So how are we going to do that? So this is a, a really a, a major challenge that, that we are all facing. So the extracting less, I think it is possible if we have more and better maps, because then you can do it much more targeted and you can really do the areas that are economically viable and you can uh, avoid areas that, that are per definition already from the very beginning, not so suitable. So if you go to the, directly to the most suitable places where you have sufficient thickness, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can actually extract um, globally, or, or rather at, a, at that scale, um, uh, less in, in, in spatial extent, but more, much more targeted. And then, of course, the, the other uh, very important aspect, uh, the minimization of risk. And this is really um, makes the connection to the need for monitoring. And so also on the Belgian shelf, we are already monitoring 30 to 40 years with the ex extraction of sand that, uh, that we are having. Uh, but also in the, in the North Sea and in other areas, there are vast monitoring programs already for a long time. There are synthesis papers, uh, lots of publications, but they are still at uh, desperate pace. Um, and especially in a, and from a scientific, in a scientific arena, this is quite well to be um, achievable to, uh, to get to this data. But for overall use, this is still um, far too limited. So with the, the platform, uh, these data can be much more centralized. We can think about synthesis studies, publications linked to, to areas, linked to depositional environments, and so on, that you can easily say, OK, give me all information about uh, shelf environments or, or other typical environments, and you will be much more efficiently led to the right uh, publication. Um, but then again, minimization of, uh, of risk uh, really needs to build on, on science. Uh, and it's complicated science, eh? because indeed, much of the impacts are slow and low amplitude. So this also means that, you, that there is a need for, for more detail, um, but also on, on a on much wider perspective on the interconnectedness of everything that you do. And so it really outweighs you. I mean, it's it's going beyond the capacity of a single team of a, of a single country. So we really need to share the expertises globally because there are so many challenges to tackle. And these are these challenges or this this research is being done, but also spread all over the world. And with the Sandwatch, uh, this again can be centralized. That this information can be much more efficiently be uh, be looked for and that also knowledge gaps can be much more easily identified than, than nowadays it's done. So we are drowning in information on the one hand, but maybe uh, there are still areas that we do not know 
anything about, but that we urgently need, uh, need to uh, to address. So I'm really looking forward, and I'm also happy to to be a provider, hopefully, to the Marine Sandwatch of information, and also making links with with mapping programs that can feed in into the into the platform. So this uh, would be really nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Thank you for your input. Um, it just seems like um, w what we're hearing so far is that the issue of sand is quite a paradox. One being a material uh, at a huge extracted at a huge volume, but perhaps being low valued and thus not very well known. Seems like we have quite a lot of science and more science is involved, but at the same time, we need to make sense of the science and have science from all disciplines coming together to provide a clearer um, information and a clearer picture to what's happening. Um, so before we open up the floor to questions, we have uh, our last speaker here today, Arno van der Welpen, who is um, the in-house SEN expert at Great Geneva, University of Geneva. Um, Arno, you, you are the project manager of uh, Marine Sand Watch, and together with Pascal, um, you, you conceptualize the project and develop the methodology. Would you take us through your thinking um, as to why you thought a platform um, was necessary and uh, what do you hope to achieve now that the Marine Sand Watch is launched? Sure. Thank you so much and thank you for giving me the floor. Um, so I think there are uh, overall there were at the, at the very beginning there were there were three points that were really driving us um, to start with this project. Um, the first one is uh, the Global Marine Sand Watch as a capacity building tool, because we noticed that although there are countries which are monitoring their exclusive economical zone on sand mining and dredging activities, the vast majority of countries do not have sufficient capacity to monitor, monitor these activities. So with the Marine Sand Watch, we actually want to support countries in understanding what kind of dredging activities is taking place in their exclusive economical zone or in, in, in the vicinity of uh, their coastlines. So that is one aspect. Um, the second aspect was creating this dialogue, bringing stakeholders together, identifying best practices, um, perhaps creating the, the information and the data to talk about cross-boundary issues, uh, housing all the scientific uh, research that is currently being done but on a national level, bringing that to an international level, because one of the issues with sand, as Vera referred to, is, is not the impact of a single project, but it's the cumulative impact of all those projects within the marine sphere. And third, but absolutely not least, is working towards a minimum environmental uh, standard. Uh, and, you know, currently in, in, in today's world, um, the sand sources, our, our procurement is, is, is designed such that the sand sources we tap into will most likely be the cheapest, but therefore not the most environmental, environmentally sustainable. And by creating transparency and by creating, uh, by providing data and information, we can open this, this discussion because before these supply chains and, and, and to a large extent to this day, these supply chains are rather opaque. And, you know, environmental standards are not just nice to have, they are a must have in, in today's world. So these were like the three drivers for us to, yeah, to start it. And I think we see already the fruits. Uh, only yesterday, uh, the dredging industry published their, their paper on, on best practices. Uh, and that's very much in response to our reports and then sustainability 20,000, uh, well, 2022. Uh, but I think also on, on, on the Marine Sandwatch, um, which, is, which is coming online. So, we're already booking some progress. So before we, we start with uh, questions, um, I'm curious and perhaps the audience curious too, uh, what lies ahead for, for the platform? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, in order to achieve um, the three points that I, I mentioned before, we, we have to add some additional cap, cap, capabilities and capacity. Currently, the platform covers 2012 to 2019. In the coming months, we want to uh, shore that up to go from 2012 to 2023. Um, but on the middle long term, for this platform to really come to its full potential, we would like to move to near real time so that you can see the dredging vessels, uh, that you have an, an almost immediate analysis. Is, is it transporting? Is it dredging? Is it dumping? And that would make this engagement with our different stakeholders so much more relevant. Um, so that is, is a, that is something we are definitely working towards. Yes. Thank you, Arno. Um, I believe uh, we've heard from our panel of experts here, and, and it's time that we open the floor up to, to questions uh, or comments. Uh, I invite you to, um, for, for our audience in the room, I invite you to uh, share with us any thoughts or questions that you might have, and uh, please keep them short so that we have time to get through to more, uh, to hear from more of our uh, audience. I see one hand up, please. Thank you uh, to the whole panel. And my name is Vijay. I'm a journalist. Um, actually, Stephanie asked two of the questions I had in my mind, so she should be a journalist herself. Yeah. So my question is to um, Arnard. So you neatly laid out the points on, um, you know, so what? We have the Marine Sand Watch now, so what? The, the specific question I have is whether the, the map um, in real time be matched with any um, you know anti dredging or sustainable dredging policies in different countries and number two how would you expect individual countries to work with you do you want to proactively reach out to them or do you uh, do outreach to the countries and expect the countries to uh, come to you for technical support and policy recommendations thank you right Thanks. Thank you for your question. Um, I think several questions. Sorry, do we have any other questions? Uh, okay, quite a few. Perhaps we'll take pick a few. Um, yes, um, over there, and then we'll we'll go to. Hello, I'm from Antigua. I'm a local community representative. Currently, we have dredging taking place. Before I left Antigua, I got a call from one of the local community groups informing me that a pipeline was being, is planned to go across the islands to deliver natural gas and the dredging was taking place. Would your artificial intelligence be able to zoom in on the island of Antigua and Barbuda? We have asked if an environmental impact assessment was conducted, but so I have so much questions coming to me because the groups normally send their queries to me, but I have not been able to respond. Thank you. Should we take one more and then I'll, I'll pass the floor to the panel. Dias Kuman from South Africa. Um, we've got dreadful mining operations on our west coast for diamonds, but those are often land-based, not dredging. Um, is this part of your model? Thank you. All right. Um, so I think we will take these three questions and then we'll open the floor up again. So for the first question, um, Pascal, Arno, okay. yeah, go no, for no, no. it. Yes, for how to engage with country. Well, good. That's a very good point because actually tomorrow and the day after tomorrow we have a global consultation as a follow up of the resolution twelve that you've seen that we were given by the UNEA two thousand twenty two the responsibility to bring more science. Uh, knowledge uh, on science, technology, and policy, and the, um, tomorrow and the day afterward, with the countries, they will tell us where they want to go with this. Uh, do they want to have further development on this knowledge uh, with regard to policy, science, and technology solutions? So, this is now in the hand of the countries. We have delivered a tool that was part of the mandate that was given to us um, two years ago. Now, what do they want to do with this tool? If a country has no capability to um, monitor what's going on in their maritime environment, they, they need to. 
they need to know what's going on. They, they already can know what's going on in terms of fishing, with, thanks to Global Fishing Watch. So they were able to monitor if uh, vessels were coming fishing in their waters and if they agree or not, and do they have the right to do it. Now they can do the same if they want to call us and say, can you monitor that? Once we have the further development of the platform and go to near real time, we could support countries. Okay, you've done concession, you provided concessions um, to certain companies for dredging sand. Are they dredging sand in those concessions or outside? Are the people dredging authorized or not? So it's possible because we have the name of the vessels, we have the name of the operators, and we can infer on the volume they are taking. So there are ways we can support countries for monitoring their own resources because. Once you've taken, let's 1 million of ton out of your uh, benthic area to the bottom of the uh, marine environment. Once you've taken all this out, it's out forever. I mean, slow, it's so slow to uh, convert uh, rocks to sand and gravels from glacier, rivers, or wave erosion. It takes really a long, hundreds of thousands of years. And let's we grab it in such a quick way. And this cumulative impact, as Arno was saying, is, is gone forever. Once you've taken these 1 million tons, it's no longer there. And uh, we tend to see the price of the extractions, okay, 3 to $12, depending on which country is the, the price of a ton of sand. But what is the value of the services? This we don't know. What is the value of sand for protecting our shoreline against erosion, against the impact of sea level rise on salinations of aquifers, on uh, fisheries and support to um, uh, as a habitat for all the, the fishing industry and, uh, and for the biodiversity? For all these services, sand do not get paid. And we need to, to make the distinctions between the price and the value because we have value of sand that is way overlooked because the price of sand for you take one ton and you make concrete it's done but that same ton can keep on working for you protecting your shoreline forever and so the price will be a cumulative price for hundreds or thousands of years so we really need to understand this price versus value yes we do have sand coming from the rivers, but less and less so because we have dam all the major rivers. So those sediments get trapped on the way, do not reach the shore. Plus we are taking sand out of the rivers, which is something that we cannot monitor right now. And we need tools for this as well, because all major rivers in Asia, for example, are being uh, mined for sand. So this sand is no longer coming to the ocean. So what would be the impact for our beaches? Uh, protection of our shoreline, biodiversity. And I think this is what we try to do with this platform, trying to bring shedding light on something that no one was able to see until now. So when you don't know, you don't talk about it. And just by placing that in a public area, now it's no random why yesterday the, the industry is publishing their best practices. This is the, you know, the, the foot in the right direction. But of course, we need to go way further. Those best practices uh, need to be implemented as standards and maybe be part of regulation framework. So this is the kind of things we will discuss with countries. Thank you, Pascal. Um, and I'm just going to have a quick look to see if any of our panel members would like to respond to the question. But otherwise, we had two other questions um, more specific to the platform itself. Uh, what can we see? What can we not see? Um, perhaps I, I, I'm looking at you, Arno. Um, I'm wondering if, if uh... sure. Um, I think the quickest one to answer is, is South Africa, and then I will move to to, to Antigua. Um, so, for the west coast of Santa, South Africa, um, indeed, um, as as I understand as well, for much of, of of the extractive practices are on on the beach and in the coastal zone. Uh, there is some dredging activities uh, as well for indeed for high valuable minerals. Uh, of the West Coast, um, I think South Africa and Namibia. Uh, these are things that we can check. At the moment, mm, I don't think it's integrated yet in the platform, but it was on our uh, to-do list as it as it does as it does include sand. I mean, it, it, it's it's judging sand. It's 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 sieving sand, taking the high value valuable minerals out of it. Um, and then dumping uh, what is remained back uh, at, at the sea. So it, 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 it is on our to-do list. Um, for the on-land part, um, there are currently projects going on on land degradation 
uh, and mining, uh, also in, in collaboration between Upgrade Geneva and, and, and the relevant conventions, CCD. UNCCD, which are particularly looking at, at, at the issue of uh, mining, and that includes uh, coastal mining. Um, so it's, 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 it's another topic. Um, for Antigua. If so, from a from a capacity point of view, um, if these are large vessels, then normally they are obliged to use AIS to give their positioning. So yes, the uh, the, the various activities is something that we are able to interpret and identify. Currently, we have we we are able to follow. 50, about 50% 50 of the large dredging fleet, of the, of the, of the, of the dredging fleet, with, which includes large vessels. There is a high likelihood, well, there is a one in two that, that we can see what is going on in Antigua. Um, Pascal, would you like to add on that? On, I don't know what you have in mind. So, <laughs> from uh, from from a point of engagement, um, it's oh, it's yeah. Well, it's something that we would like to improve the capacity of the platform to develop these things and improve our uh, artificial intelligence to detect those things. Of course, it will also depend on the mandate we will receive, and that's what will be discussed tomorrow and after tomorrow. Will will the country are interested for us to do this kind of monitoring? At the moment, it was to bring more knowledge on the volumes and where it was extracted, not necessarily to track and denounce bad practices, but if a, a country is asking us, we have all the data on who's doing what and is it authorized or not, then it's the, the country that needs to tell us because they are the one providing authorization. But we can say, this is happening in this location, this is what we see. And that's done by this vessel, by this operator uh, with this flag, and then up to the country to to, to make sure it's legal or, or if they need to take action. But the what date, it's uh, a bad practice. We have had a lot of cases where the government considers profit over environment. And that's why we as the local community groups have to be very vigilant with our advocacy. We have to basically go on the radio and wake up the people. Now we live on the land. This dredging is taking place in a marine protected areas. So it's the fishermen and the people out on the waters that's bringing in the information and informing us. It's not coming from the government and the government would probably get very angry at me saying things like this, but we live in a small island. There's a hurricane coming right now and all these things reduce our resilience. And so people like me are very environmentally conscious um, aim to provide good governance processes and when the people inform me what's going on i usually go to the relevant government authorities i already contacted the focal point he said he is not aware who is the focal point for antigua for minerals and whatnot so i as a local representative is here and i'm making my voice very clear on behalf of the local communities in Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you. No, maybe we, Thank I think you. we can, you know, we... this tool will empower also um, the civil society because it's, it's done not only for the country, it's also for the industry to watch what they're doing is, is to internal, to do their internal police, but also for the civil society to follow what's going on. We can see that with deforestation now, people can watch it uh, nearly live. And if it's been touched in a protected area, they can, you know, they can make their voice heard. Mm. Okay, one. Mm -hmm. Maybe Thanks. to add to Pascal. So, just yesterday, uh, the International Association of Dredging Companies published this document on on best practices. I think the the beauty of of this interaction between stakeholders on the ground, the industry, and and the space, 
that we provide is that these interactions are possible. And so the data will be online and that gives you the, the ability to put the data next to the best practices um, and to create your narrative from that. Thank you. I see there are two hands up. We have quite a few questions uh, online. I just want to quickly check uh, those. Um, would you like to respond to what has, what has been discussed or are they new topics? New topics as well? Yeah, okay. So we're going to, is it new topics? Sorry? Yeah, okay. So we're going to quickly um, get to a few questions from our online uh, audience and then we'll get back to you. Okay. Um, we have quite a few technical questions uh, about how the methodology and how do we come up with the numbers. Um, before I, I, I go to that, I, I'd like to have. Um, present a couple of more like broader questions so that all of our panelists would be uh, would feel able to respond to them. Um, uh, first, one from uh, Mark Roche, um, um, who congratulates um, you on the, the launch of the platform. Um, the, the question here is, um, is sand extraction regulated in, in the EEZ? Um, and uh, how this, how is sand extraction regulated? Um, because he sees that legislation is one of the main problems. Um, so that's one question. Um, and also there's another question from a uh, journalist uh, from Radio Free Asia um, asking specifically, what do we see um, sand extraction as, uh, how do we see it? Um, it as a problem in Asia, and if there's a specific a country in Asia that that we would like to to highlight, and do we have information on that? Um, and also, um, yeah, like what can we can say about that? Especially because Pascal, you um, highlighted extraction around the North Sea in in your presentation. So we'll we'll take to we'll take these two, and then we'll go to a few more technical questions. So I'll open the floor. Up. I'll open it to our panelists. Legislation, easy. Would you mm -hmm. like me to repeat the question? No, no, no uh, it's yeah. okay. It's okay. Um, yes, especially in the in the North Atlantic, uh, there is a lot of uh, regu environmental regulation. So on the one hand, you have the regional sea conventions, and then you have increasingly also European directives that are uh, putting uh, indicators for for monitoring and also increasingly thresholds of change. Um, so in the, in the European um, uh, framework, um, you have the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and now there are also uh, yeah, increasingly um, um, demands that, and, and uh, so I will restart. So within the European Strategy Framework Directive, each member state has, has to monitor its environmental status and report on that every six years. And you have to have a, an adequate monitoring program uh, to that. And uh, so one of the, of the uh, descriptors of good environmental status is on the seafloor integrity. And for that, there are indicators that uh, demands from member states to quantify physical disturbance and loss. So, so generally speaking, and depending again on the type of environment, aggregate extraction will lead to loss or not. So as long as you are not changing the habitat or, or really uh, taking biogenic habitats directly, uh, it, it is called, or you can uh, classify it as disturbance. But if there is really a change from a sand to a coarse habitat, or if you get a siltation, if you have changes from sand to mud, mud to sand, and uh, and especially the the big um, question is related to the coarse substrate. Uh, if uh, if coarse substrates like gravel type are changing into sands, uh, then you have a habitat loss. Uh, and in the next MSFD uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive cycle. Um, there is now a plea to go for a threshold, allowable threshold of 2% loss per broad scale habitat only. So 2% loss is, is really very uh, a narrow threshold. So this, is, this forces really member states to, to really uh, pin down their, their monitoring efforts 
and uh, and also to increase the knowledge of the of the habitats uh, that uh, that are also partly being dredged. Um, but so that the platform, of course, beyond Europe, there is also a lot of environmental regulations in the United States and and, and uh, the South and uh, Australia and, and you name it. Um, so so the platform will really have its beneficial uh, value to to bring all of these kinds of regulations together. Um, and also, this can then also inform the the minimum standards uh, that uh, that will be be being worked on um, by by experts and by uh, combined with uh, with data or informed by data. I I think it's 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 really what 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 Vera says is when when we are interacting with stakeholders and we ask for best practices and 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 regions and countries where those best practices are put in place, we always hear the same number of countries. And these are countries that have put in place a certain policy framework that forces the industry to adhere to a minimum environmental standard or a minimum environmental requirement. And so um, it's it's there is a, a, a vast room for improving the policy frameworks over uh, across the world based on the experiences that those countries that have put policy frameworks in place have, have, have had. So yes, Vera, I, I, I think you're spot on. Um, yes. And to Mark, yes, there is a, a big room for and do we see certain areas in Asia? Just to answer that question on uh, on Asia, I, I understand this is an issue that requires uh, global attention. It, it affects many regions around the world. But perhaps, if you like to say a sentence or two about what we see is happening um, in Asia, I think if we're talking about Southeast Asia and East Asia, the, the, there there has already in the last ten to twenty years been various steps have uh, been taken in Southeast Asia and in East, in East Asia. Some are experimental. Um, we, we see, for example, Japan has completely changed uh, how judging practices have been regulated between, let's say, the 1960s and nowadays. Uh, we have seen that uh, China has taken certain steps uh, when it comes to river judging. Um, so a, a lot of, of, of actions are being happening, but they are happening at the national level. There is, there is, there is, in my view, not enough exchange yet on which policy practices really work for specific countries so that we can have this genuine exchange because the ecosystem of one country is not the ecosystem of another country. Uh, the way the ecosystem works in the tropics is not the way the ecosystem works in the North Sea. Um, certain countries, the sand is, is mainly to be found in the dynamic area. In other countries, the sand can be found in fossilized sand dunes. It, it, there is a context to be given, and there are, there are many things to, to exchange upon. Uh, but I could go on and on on, on, on Southeast Asia. And I, for example, Singapore has been looking at how to substitute um, Silt and uh, sand by silt and clay to an extent in their land reclamation projects, or how to, uh, and that is something we see in many uh, advanced, uh, uh, very, very, uh, from a dredging point of view, advanced countries, how to use dredged material in land reclamation projects so that virgin sources do not need to be tapped into, but as much as possible, uh, a kind of circular. Uh, economy is 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 put in place. Um, yeah, and that's a, a good segue to quite a few questions, and I'm going to try to summarize them um, online about the the platform and and the the methodology that was involved. Um, th there was a question of um, what is actually showcased on the platform. Is it sand? Is it silt? Is it uh, mud? Um, so this is something perhaps would be good to clarify. Um, there's also a qu another question about why do we make the comparison, and this is uh, perhaps uh, referring to the press release by press release by UNEP yesterday. Why make the comparison to the 
uh, flow of sediment uh, from rivers. Uh, the, this audience member, he he mentioned how in the UK, for example, a lot of the extraction happens uh, from land-based resources. And um, another question online we have is about informal sand mining, because we mentioned, Pascal, we heard from you that um, there are a lot of uh, boats, vessels even, um, that are either not equipped with AIS or we are not even picking up the signals for various reasons. So one is how do we, what does it actually uh, report and show and um, how do we respond to those different um, realities, I guess. Yeah, I can start on the, <clears throat> the question of um, what we can see. In terms of small boats, the operating, yes, this is an issue. As I say in the, in the presentation, they is, they're not equipped with AIS. So for all technology, we cannot uh, bring them in the statistics. And But they are small boats, but they're numerous. So in, the, in developing countries, we see informal sector is, uh, is you know, bringing most of the sand. Uh, we've seen that in Asia, in dredging in the uh, rivers environment, which is also not uh, tackled by the, the platform. So we need also to cover other types of uh, uh, practices than just those large vessels that we are tracking right now. So that's the first step in the right direction. We have already monitored what those vessels are doing, and may, we can uh, already shed light on that one. But uh, the small boats and the uh, practices from the informal sector is something we're really worried about. We've seen what were the impact in Asia on ecosystems, on rivers, uh, flows, and uh, uh, river banks erosions. We we really see that those um, numerous but small actors were playing uh, having a large impact on the environment. And something that we have seen in Asia is now happening in Africa uh, to we see that uh, African continent population is going to double from now to 2050. That's plus 1.27 billion people. And on top of the demographic, you have people migrating from villages to urban area, and also all the needs for roads, dams, schools, hospital, all these three drivers are going to exacerbate the demand for building material and amongst them sand and gravel. And what we see is currently all this material is coming from the informal sector. So they go in these places where we're saying the dynamic setting, so rivers, beaches, and shallow uh, sea environment to bring, because it's easier to bring it from there. And what we would like is to help and we could work with the international labor organization how to transfer this informal sector to a more formal sector because they need investment they need hardware hard tools that are too expensive for them if you want to move people from mining sand from beaches rivers and shallow uh, marine area to quarries they need uh, hardware tool that's not easy so there is a need to support that shift but it's very important that the government make that request because so far they're not um, really proactive but uh, we had a, a consultation a regional consultation in dakar amongst we had regional consultation everywhere but the one in dakar was extremely impressive because we saw every single african countries were mentioning the issue they've got with sand that it's out of control that they they don't know how to deal with that it's causing huge problems we saw this report from the world bank uh 5.4 percent of the gdp of all the western african countries is affected by coastal degradation and this is induced uh in a fair amount by the mining of sand in the marine and in the beach environment. So this is something that we really need to, to target. Now, this tool is already um, taking care of what was the easiest for us, even though it took us two years uh, to get the boats, big vessels for the large industry, then moving into small boats, uh, rivering, mining, and so on. That's going to be more difficult, more challenging. Uh, but um, we have ideas um, using remote sensing, using citizen science, using indirect statistics from the uh, the building that we can see. So there are ways to do things, but um, yeah, that's time for next stories. Uh, it will be more difficult than this one, even though this one was uh, already uh, full of uh, challenges. Thank you, Pascal, and, and, and for, for also clarifying what are some of the possibilities. So I guess those would be depending on how it goes with consulting with member states and, and I guess, level of support, uh, resources available, obviously, and obviously <laughs> because um, the question was indeed, how do we 
uh, make sure that we get a, a good understanding of what's happening, not just from boats that are vessels that are doing it and that we can pick up the AIS from. So just to quickly go to the, the second part of my question, and we'll go back to the two questions from the room uh, about the methodology uh, as, as well that um comparison with uh, with the river budget exactly yeah. how, how do we how do we why and and what do we actually dredge and if you could also just uh, quickly mention what kind of activities that um users of the platform could could differentiate uh, sure. also, yeah yes. yeah so maybe starting with the river budget uh with, with the sediment budget so basically the amount of sediment that is brought from mountain to sea i think it is when it, when we talk about the dynamic environments being river coastal environments, uh, the marine area. This is one of the most important metrics. Because, I mean, I love the, the following comparison. If you wanna loan money from the bank, you go to the bank and you ask, and the bank will ask how much do you have in your account and how much is coming in. You can't take more than you have on your account and what is coming in. If we take material from the dynamic environment, if we are taking more material out of, out of those rivers than is within those rivers or within those coastal em environments, and more than what is coming in, this is not going to be sustainable. And that is what we see for many regions, is that we are taking much more material than what is coming in. And so when we talk about the dynamic environment, the me met metrics to use on a global level is that sediment budget. What is coming in? What are we taking out on a re regional level as well? Um, so that, that for that metric. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about what can we see on the platform? So currently um, for... So we, we, we differentiated between different types of extraction of dredging vessels. Um, and for the most common type of dredging vessel, the trailing suction hopper dredger, it's that vacuum cleaner that uh, Pascal has shown earlier. Uh, for that one, we have done more advanced analysis on um, what are sand concessions, where is it mining sand? What, where is it maintaining channels? Where is it creating new infrastructure, which we call capital dredging? So for the most common type of vessel, you can already see on the platform, is it creating new infrastructure? Is it involved in maintaining vessels, uh, maintaining uh, waterways? Or is it mining sand? Um, of course, we also show the dredging activity of all types of dredging vessels, like over, over the world. Um, and that is also uh, shown on the platform. It's not subdivided into, um, into different activities. Although we do explain per vessel type, what it is usually involved in, for example, yeah. And thank you, thank you, I know. And um, the platform is now online. And just to quickly um, pitch this because it was also a question online. It is public, it is free for all. Um, the information, as I understand it, is public uh, and available to, to everyone. Um, so we could share the link to the website um, uh, in chat. Um, so I encourage uh, those in the, uh, those joining us today to to check it out. Um, I, I see that we still have a few minutes, um, so I'd like to turn our attention back to the questions we have. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Um, the tool looks fascinating. Um, I In September of 2022, I was living in the North Atlantic, and we were faced with the largest hurricane in human memory, uh, definitely the largest hurricane in the last hundred years, which resulted in the sand dunes, which were protecting this tiny little island that we were living on to be completely decimated. And all that sand was taken out onto the ocean, into the ocean, which sat in sand reserves and which will, with time, 
come back to shore and the dunes will return. So as we see, sand moves. Um, and this summer we saw the warmest temperatures in the ocean. Um, scientists are predicting that ocean currents are going to be changing in a dramatic way. And so from, from your research, um, how do you, is there forecasting models on where sand will be moving? Um, and also you spoke about fairly extensive infrastructure that is being built for these operations. So um, what will that look like for countries that heavily invest in this in the future? Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the room? Yes, please. Yeah. Then we'll, I'll open it up to the panelists. Thank you so much, Karin Sigvat from IUCN. And as the resolution was pointed out at the beginning, I have just a, a short question on, on the uh, content of the resolution. And I was wondering if this uh, platform co could also give an answer to this uh, request. In the resolution, we had also, um, we asked for measures to stop uh, all illegal sand mining activities. Does this platform help to have a look where it's illegal? Thank you. So we would, uh, I'll, I will pass it on to the panelists to take these two questions. And I'd like to end the session with uh, a, one question from uh, that we have online. So turn to our experts. Yep. Okay. You want to start? <laughs> okay. Please. I can start with the storm. <laughs> um, no, the, the thing is that indeed everything is interconnected. And again, depending on the environment that you are in, uh, it is true that storms can have a more important impact within a given time frame than, for instance, dredging. Uh, and indeed, uh, you can have major storms that bring in a lot of sediment and that may bury sensitive species. And indeed, it does occur, but it's cumulative that is that everything is happening. So we have so many human activities and we have nature that would, that will work with what it has. And so the sand mass that there is or not is, nature will work with. So, and then it's a question of, uh, will you have um, impacts that reinforce one another or will they work antagonistically? And this is very difficult to, to project, of course. So from a forecasting perspective, uh, more and more um, people are able to, to, to forecast sediment displacement and where it will go to. But again, the whole um, way that, that, that nature will redistribute uh, sands across areas is very difficult because again, it's about, often it's about low amplitude and slow processes. So, uh, so it does require, on the field or in the field, it requires quite some detailed research to, to track what is natural, what is human induced, but ultimately it's one on top of the other. So a couple of years ago, we were indeed thinking about disentangling or trying to disentangle natural from human activity impacts, but I guess this makes no sense because it's, it's something that works together. So, uh, yeah, so there, there is no clear, straightforward answer to your question, but it's, it's something that you just have to take along within, within the, the assessment of impacts. The, the question was if the platform can do that, it was not designed for that. It was not designed to see how natural movement of sand is occurring. It was to see how human-induced movement that is withdrawing or pumping or cleaning are induced. So we are monitoring human uh, activity is not the natural, uh, that's the, the platform. The natural movement has always gone and and we're just part of the planet system. Now, if you withdraw sand, those natural movement will be affected, as uh, Vera was saying. Now, on, on the, so it says no, the platform is not monitoring the natural movement of sand. Uh, on your question on illegal sand mining, yes and no. Um, yes, if, um, vessels that are emitting AIS signal have been dredging outside of uh, concessions that were provided to them or they were 
illegally acting in um, the exclusive economic zone of a specific country, we can help that we are not the police. The legislation is with the country, but if the member state is asking our assistance for that, we can go back into from 2012 to 2019 and, and now to two, coming in 2023. And in the future, we hope to be doing that in the real time. So we could help a country to see if a company or vessels have been operating outside what were uh, agreed or license provided or with no license, which was the case already for the fishing industry. And some member states have been requesting uh, support to see to monitor because it's it's not common for countries to be equipped with this kind of system. So the answer on that specific uh, case would be yes, if they have AIS system, we can. Now, if they decided to do illegally, they might switch off the AIS and then we, they become invisible, except that we see uh, vessels coming as ghosts and then reappearing. Now, you cannot say all the time, oh, my AI system was not, was dysfunctioning. If you do that repeatedly, and especially in places that we think uh, could be uh, uh, dubious, this has been done again for the fishing industry. There were regularly some fishermen they were switching off the AI system, going to the no-take area, taking some fishes. Now those boats have been put on a blacklist. The most easiest way is to try. We can detect that when you switch it off suddenly and then it reappears. You can make a list if it's repeated, put that on a blacklist, send that to those insurances that are insuring vessels and then all over able to navigate. So that's a very easy and quick solution. So again, even if you switch off the AIS, if you if there is a willingness from the country to do it, again, we can monitor. Now, when we are referring to illegal, but more like the informal, that very poor people, and I don't like uh, in, the, in the media, we see often the mafia, the sand mafia and all things. Let's be careful about that. There are very poor people that have no other livelihood than taking a shovel and put sand on the back of a truck. It's not fun, it's not well paid. And for those people, it's not the question of being legal or illegal. Yes, we want that activity to stop because it's harming the beaches and harming the environment. But we need to give them a way, a fallback options for their livelihood. So that's why I was calling for a transfer from the informal sector to the formal sector. That's where we need to do developments and we need to be there for those people so that they can, we need the sand, let's not be hypocrites. We are using sand for making a lot of stuff and that comes sometimes from this informal sector. So let's give this informal sector a boost where they can be moved in extracting sand from quarries in appropriate way where the country is issuing concessions. We can monitor what's going on. It's land-based sand, crunching rock for extracting from uh, quarries and that would be the better option. Uh, monitoring sand illegally on the beaches would be extremely difficult uh, and quite frankly dangerous for those people who would like to do that uh, from the ground. We've seen uh, dozens of journalists actually being killed trying to do surveys on that. I, I have their names. I'm using them sometimes to pay memory and attention to those journalists who are uh, paying the deep price of their life for bringing this uh, information and the truth to the to the reality. So. We bring the invisible visible with safely IT technologies. Some people do that from the ground and take way more risk. So uh, that's a different story. And I think it's just part of the overall moving to sustainable development and uh, helping uh, alleviation of poverty. Thank you, Pascal. Um, and looking at the time, we have just a few more minutes. But before we conclude, I have a question for all our panelists here. Um, and that is the question of um, now what? Um, I think one thing that we've heard from the audience and from yourself today is, is the issue of who should do what? Um, and there is this question um, or several questions uh, or inputs from online as well about the role of uh, governments um, in, in this whole process. And understanding that there is a discrepancy in terms of how different nations have different capacity and capability to monitor um, the dredging activities in, in the marine environment, um, also correlating with a different level of legislation that's uh, out there. Um, at the same time, we see that uh, the dredging industry is also very present online, um, talking about uh, good best practices, and also knowing that they operate 
in these different countries with different capacity to monitor. So it's kind of like a, a chicken and egg situation, um, knowing that we need better legislation, but we also need better compliance to these legis uh, legislations. So I would like to end by asking you, what do you think, um, how can we move forward when it comes to capacity building, um, and especially thinking how Marine Sandwatch could support that um, in the overall effort to ensure better monitoring and uh, practices, better practices in, in, in marine sand sediment extraction. So I'll open up the floor, whoever who likes to go first. If you could just give a line or two of your concluding remarks. Yes, maybe. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. So, as I mentioned in uh, in my remarks, I think one uh, very interesting way forward would be first the Marine Sand Watch is now uh, up and running. It's available on uh, on, on internet. Uh, it will be um, improved uh, and uh, further developed. But that's one element. It's part of the of the picture. But as we had in the discussion today, uh, there are other sources of extraction of sand. There are other uh, needs as well to um, further discuss, uh, strengthen cooperation, uh, collect best practices, uh, share those best practices. Um, and, uh, and for that, uh, this um, idea I refer to of, um, of uh, setting up a global sound observatory, which has been discussed among member states, it would be very interesting in the next couple of days, actually, we will have this meeting in, the, in this room, actually, <laughs> tomorrow and Friday, and we will hear other views. Uh, I, I think Switzerland would very much welcome the, the, the setting up of this uh, global sound observatory. Um, and uh, and I, I think the discussion has to continue because um, there is a lot to do. There is a lot of um, uh, more knowledge to gather, a lot of um, of needs and gaps uh, in this area. And um, we will have the discussion uh, tomorrow on Friday. But then there will be other um, um, uh, how do you say that, um, other moments which will be also important for this uh, this topic to uh, to make progress. That will be the next United Nations Environment Assembly in February 2024, where member states will further discuss the, um, the issue of minerals. There will be a, a presentation of the outcome of this process uh, of the discussion tomorrow in February. And there um, it, it could be well be the, the, the case that uh, member states uh, maybe de uh, decide to take further steps uh, in, in with respect to minerals and sand. and. Uh, um, I hope we can continue the, the discussion uh, that way at the international level. Thank you, Laura, and we're grateful for uh, Switzerland's support. Um, Pascal, a few uh, sentences of concluding remarks. Yes, thank you. Well, this issue of sand or story of sand is the same story if, that we have our relationship with uh, unsustainable use of natural resources. And that's why we have this World Resource Forum to talk about that. Uh, we thought we had infinite amount of forest. It's not the case. We have deforestation ongoing, uh, even though this morning we heard that it's slowing down in Brazil. This is good news. But so we have tools for monitoring deforestation and that is shedding light on those practices. So it's helping people to fight about that. We had the same thing with Global Fishing Watch when they started doing that on fisheries. We are emptying our oceans. Overfishing is happening at, at scale. Uh, it's uh, it's um, devastating uh, assault of uh, against the biodiversity and, and no support of livelihood. And the fisheries um, vessels are way too numerous uh, going very far, including with subsidies from government. So there's lots of things to be addressed. Again, now we have a tool with Global uh, Fishing Watch monitoring fishing. The same was happening with sand. We are we are at the beginning. This issue of sand has been overlooked. Uh, it's the invisible heroes of our development. It's everywhere, yet no one was looking at it. Uh, two years ago, we had a session at the World Resource Forum called uh, sand the elephant in the mining room because it is the biggest not only it is the biggest because it's about half of all what we're extracting is about sand but as we saw from previous session a lot of the minerals that are extracted is leaving sand and rocks aside in tailings instead of using it and that's uh, really ridiculous i mean a few generations from now when people will be retailing they would say hey guys you what were you doing you've been placing valuable uh, resources in the trash. So you consider that as mining waste, but in fact, it was a waste of resources. 
and the amount of uh, sand and rocks that our intailings are yearly produce are amounting to 30 to 60 billion tons. This is enough. If we were re retrieving it from that, we will not be uh, need to take it from the marine environment, the beaches, or the rivers. So I'm calling here if we can that all governments should ask their mining industry to do an assessment. What is the substance in your tailing? Is it if it's fully radioactive and full of uh, toxics? Okay, we'll deal differently. But if it's clean, as we have done some analysis, was so clean that actually you could even make refine it to make glass because it was like silica sand. So if it's so clean, why don't you use it for the building industry? The impact is already done for the mining. Let's use this uh, co-generate uh, minerals and building material rather than doing extractions of iron somewhere and then dumping huge amount of tailings and then you go somewhere else and you dig again rocks and gravels that <laughs> could be taken from the already impacted area in mining so let's be much wiser on how we do things on how we access resources let's rethink our consumption it's not a slight change here we're talking about a massive revolution on the way we consume and produce goods because we are going against the wall and we are accelerating we can see all the indicators monitoring is good but i've been monitoring deforestation uh, using satellite imagery first at one kilometer resolution then at 30 then at 10 now i can do that at 35 centimeters i still see deforestation so monitoring is a first step in the right direction, but then you need to enforce, you need to take action so that we can uh, do things differently. And there are lots of solutions. We provide some of them in our report in 2022. Let's rethink our development based towards sustainable development. And uh, not only for sand, but for all kinds of resources. I hope that um, this measure will be heard and I will deep further discussion with the member states uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. Um, I know I don't know if you have anything to, to add, um, and then I would like to conclude uh, with uh, various remarks. I, I I think I would I would like to invite all stakeholders to tell us your story uh, because that for us is a huge inspiration. Tell us your story. Share with us your best practices and. That inspires us while developing this platform um, to make it more tailored to the needs of uh, all those stakeholders that make use of the platform. So I would like to end with a, a big invitation to everyone who is sitting here online or in present, share with us your story, your best practices. Uh, and, and, and that is the first stepping stone. Mm -hmm. And they could reach you at sand at unepgrid.ch because I see there were a few very specific questions about the methodology. And I think it'd be great if they could reach out to you personally for that. So just uh, just a note. So last but not least, Vera, uh, on capacity building, your thoughts and uh, conclusion to, to the session. Okay. Um... On capacity building, yes, um, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I, I really uh, re-emphasize that the, the dialogue is really what, what should follow. And, and then indeed helping each other and then the training and capacity building comes uh, with that. So, uh, so also for, for students, it is a, a great tool at, for, for, first of all, also to bring awareness uh, because only little is, uh, is known about uh, aggregate extraction, the, the need for it and, and the impacts with it. And if you can show that on a global basis, then, then it's, it's really fantastic to, to have such a tool. So I will happily use it in my class as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Vera. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks, a uh, big thank you to our audience online and for the very interesting discussion. Um, as I've mentioned, the tool is now online um, and also for any other further questions, engagement, please uh, reach out to the UNEP Grid team at san at unepgrid.ch. So with this, uh, I'd like to conclude the session today. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to our panelists as well. Thank you.